Coming to you live from Radio Canaan Studio. For the record. For the record. For the record. Here, Here from, from your, your government, government officials, officials, independents, and the opposition on issues that matter to you. For the record. Engage in an open dialogue between residents and lawmakers. For the record. For the record. Informative, impartial, insightful. This is your talk show. 1-800-534-8255. Your calls, your input. This is For the Record. And now, your host, Arit Connor. Is uh, the U.S. and the European communities. We talked a little bit about NATO, how NATO was formed. And to try and give them as much as you can in an hour or two and they actually sat down and listened and you know they're trying to piece these bits and pieces together and like following the dots and after a bit they came back at night when we were having dinner because John's away and he says you know they started to ask some questions because they're now doing RE um, for their O levels and that invites them also to think of different ways of how religion shapes our views and our pattern of behavior in um, different communities So I suspect this week will be filled with those types of discussions now that the kids have opened it and I'm trying to invite them to think through how we think in different communities and why, why leadership changes. They watched Theresa May speak a little bit about the response to the atrocity Mm -hmm. and they compared that response, for example, to Donald Trump's response. And, you know, so as I was dropping them off this morning, David said, you know, mom, maybe there's a difference in terms of gender and leadership and that's those were his last words when he uh, went out of the car this morning so that was interesting for me to have that conversation with them and just listening to them because those that the type of prejudices that we perhaps as adults have these kids don't have those types of prejudices mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. and they see the world really really differently from a different yeah, uh, lens yeah. altogether but talk, yeah. speaking about uh, the, the the women i was thinking over the past week when we had all of the negotiations in terms of the formation of a government and we hear the story of one female um, being involved in discussions that's that would be uh, 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 Ms. Julia, Juliana mm-hmm. O'Connor mm-hmm. Connolly and I said to myself would the dynamics have been different if we had uh, allowed three elected females to Ne- be involved in the negotiations, negotiations and let them determine the makeup of our government as opposed to someone else what what that would would be like uh you know we we, we probably would have seen a completely different makeup of the government and maybe more rationality uh you know in, in involved in it as well yeah I, I don't even know if they even considered it because <laughs> i i had the uh, pleasure actually a real pleasure of speaking to the Honorable Tara Rivers on Friday. We were out at the uh, KPMG uh, celebrate, celebrating their 50th mm-hmm. anniversary. That was a very colorful experience uh, uh, on Friday night. And, you know, we were talking a little bit about her first experience. Not a lot because, you know, that's really not the place to have those kind mm-hmm. of conversations. But what was very heartening was the way in which she embraced these next four years about the challenges and what she learned from the first four years and how she, her vision of how she would like to see things evolve. And that, that was a really, really pleasant experience for me. Yeah. Okay. We have one caller. Let's go to the phone lines. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, Mr. Connor. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, Mr. Risa and Mr. Maxfield. Well, Mr. McPhee isn't with us this morning. Unfortunately, he is occupied in the courts today. Okay, who's there with you besides yourself? It's just, just poor, the two of the us, two like of the us. song says. Yeah, just, just the, the two, two of, of us. us. <laughs> <laughs> Grover Washington. Um, <laughs> okay, um, first I'd like to say that I'm very happy with the new government that is in. I feel that, um, you know, it, it's, a, it's a mixture that will go down well. And, you know, um, I must say that I am very, very satisfied that um, Mr. Um, Alden McLaughlin is um, is back premier. Mm -hmm. Because, you know, whatever they may say about him, I still feel Mr. Alden cares a lot about his people, you know, and will do the right thing once he got the right person, you know. and, And he can always, you know, he can always talk with him about things. 
I am also pleased about the speaker, too. <laughs> oh, yes, I think he's in a very good spot, you know. And um, you know well, why I say that is because um, I feel that um, if he had got a premier job, he was going to be put on a spot by um, too many people, um, you know, with, with, with certain things. Mm -hmm. I, I know certain things that I'm talking about. And mm -hmm. I think that that's a very good position that, that, that he's in there, that he won't have to answer the call of many. Anyway, I must say, huh, my John John, Mr. Dwayne Seymour, I could not be more pleased. I am so happy for him. He got in. He got a minister's seat. Mm -hmm. And one thing with John John, he's a very humble man, and I know he will work with anybody. That is very, very, very good about him. Mm -hmm. And he's got a team behind him who is going to help him all the way. Well done. We uh, have a lot. We have a lot to do in Bowden Town. Mm -hmm. Before you go, caller, uh, yes, uh, there's a lot to do. Uh, Bowden Town has, for several consecutive terms now, always had a representative in cabinet. But yet you see things lacking in Bordentown. I'm not sure whether or not we have fixed the gully up there yet, and I know you have been severely affected by that in the past with the flooding and everything. Uh, we had the chaos at the public beach. Uh, that uh, situation hasn't been resolved. We had the um, the dump issue uh, where uh, the uh, recycling was going to be put in Bordentown. We had the abandonment of the uh, locate, relocation of uh, the police station and a fire station uh, on the, uh, the, the bypass road, the Anton Borden uh, Drive, I think it is, you know, as well. What are your expectations? Do you expect to see more bearing in mind that Bordentown, again, has uh, 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 one of its members in cabinet? Oh, I'm looking to see. I'll give it a say. <laughs> within, within our first hundred days, just like USC, we're going to get a mountain load of things done in Bordentown under John Dwayne Seymour. I'm very positive because under the other government, we got nothing. And I'm looking for our area to get flooded again if you go and look and see what happened down in the back of um, local garden where the, this road was built up we, we're gonna get flooded out here again and it, it, it's horrible it's it, it's it's terrible what's going to take place again nothing was done in bond town anyway how i look at bond town we are the swing state uh, that's and, interesting and when we decided that we gonna put you out we gonna put you out and we did that we scraped ground and I'm looking for big things that's going to take place in this district because I am going to be behind my minister and everything that he do, that anything that I can help me and all of the wonderful team that he had behind him, we are going to stand by him because we know the man that he is. And we know if he can't get it done, it's not needed to be done. Okay. Very okay. pleased with John John. Very pleased with him. Thank so you very I'm much. just asking people to be, be patient as he gets things done for them. Thank you very much, caller. You have a great day as well. Yeah. Folks, I want to remind you that you're listening to For the Record. I'm your host, Dora Connor, my guest in the studio, my co-host with me this morning, Ms. Theresa Pitcairn. Please stay tuned. Going to a commercial break. And For the Record will return immediately after that break. Good morning. Welcome back to For the Record. In the studio with me this morning, Ms. Theresa Pitcairn. Ms. Theresa, um, being a Bodden Towner, and uh, you know, I must say that my roots are, uh, come from Bodden Town as well. That when, makes uh, my, you special. Yes, my father grew up uh, basically in Bodden Town as a youngster before they moved to um, to Georgetown as well. Uh, any comments on, on, on the caller's yeah. uh, remarks? You notice I said that that makes you special. Uh, <laughs> Mr. Burley would say that um, Bordentown is a differential. <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, uh, it, Bordentown is a unique district. And when Bordentown, people make up their minds about doing certain things, they do it. I'm reminded actually of my uncle. Uh, as you know, he was a police, mm -hmm, much like mm -hmm, my mom. Mm -hmm. And 
And one evening, you can tell it, you can call his name too if you want. Yeah, <laughs> that's Roy yeah, Anderson. Roy Anderson. So one evening, Uncle Roy was in his hammock playing his guitar as he usually does, and the Honorable um, Mr. Jefferson at the time was speeding through Bordentown. Now, if you know Bordentown and you know where the two cannons are, yes. my uncle's house was right behind that, mm -hmm. and he could see everything that went on <laughs> on the road. And Mr. Jefferson was speeding. And, you know, my uncle continued to play the guitar as if nothing happened. The next morning, he called up Mr. Jefferson and said, the next time you're in my district, you make sure you watch how you're driving and observe the speed limits. That speaks to the character of the average Bordentown person. They are, I mean, people would say that they're in your face, but not really. A very candid group of people, and they don't allow... Um, nobility or anything like that to interfere with their views and they do things in a very they tend to do things in a very respectful manner so i was not really surprised by the results in Bordentown because it appeared as though people were pretty disenchanted with the way things were um, were, were were happening and it's unfortunate that some of the things that were said among candidates and between candidates were as offensive as they were this time around because it's a small community we all go to the same church we all speak to the same minister and so on so bontoners were dissatisfied and as you rightly said we've had a series of uh, politicians who have been in cabinet and had an opportunity to bring about certain changes one of the some of the concerns i have had certainly when i ran in the past was the way in which I saw an explosion of youth unemployment when they leave school. And, you know, the number of unwed moms uh, that were young, uh, the proliferation of that sort of uh, activity. And I would always ask myself, what brings that around? What, that, what, what tends to bring that about? So there was the issue of youth unemployment. And I know the previous caller that, just, that, that was just with us on air they have had a running concern about flooding mm -hmm, in that mm -hmm, area. Mm -hmm. And I know attempts were made to try and deal with it from a, um, from a technical level, but they never quite addressed the concerns. So perhaps this time around, you know, uh, a deliberate attempt will be made to actually address that issue because it's not just in the Cumber area. It's also in the eastern area of the Bordentown area as well that you have that type of pl flooding. Bordentown is a commercial district in as much as it's a sleepy district. It's a commercial area. So when you see the rentals, vacation rentals that we have and the new hotel that's going on in Beach Bay and the way in which Bordentowners have always been um, small entrepreneurs. In fact, people like Miss. Uh, Miss Lillian comes to mind. Miss Christine comes to mind. Mm -hmm. These are women that were entrepreneurs who not only fed um, their families, but fed the entire Bontown community when we were growing up. And it's not surprising that you had, pardon me, uh, you know, others, you know, the, the kind of caves that we now have. Mm -hmm. and, and we've now made that into a tourist uh, venue. Uh, we We also have the whole commercialization of uh, of and I'm, 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 I don't even want to get into the politics of this but the commer commercialization of the topic of building a dump whether the dump remains in Georgetown whether or not the dump comes to Bordentown so Bordentowners have quite a few issues that they want to actually address uh, unemployment with the youngsters making sure that you know they are not, the devil always find hands, time for idle hands is, is the saying that we, we tend to have. They want to address that. They want to address what is going on in the uh, the Cumber area with the flooding. But they want to revitalize the area as well. And trying to preserve that sleepy uh, atmosphere which attracts the tourists to that area and combining it with commercialization I think is going to be one of the challenges the gentleman that actually is responsible for building the hotel in the in in Beach the Bay. Beach Bay area, I had the pleasure of speaking to him some years ago, and when he and I spoke, I invited him to consider 
um, the way in which the water has always played a significant role for us, especially in Bonton, because as I'm thinking, I'm thinking of my mother going fishing with Olson and Miss Caroline. And, you know, Bonton is actually hold that kind of sacred as well. Mm-hmm. If you had a situation where you could have boats come from the hotel area to different areas in the Bontown area, like where Miss Lillian Restaurant is up in the Breakers area as well, so that the persons who live or who uh, ha- spend their vacations in that location would have that opportunity to embrace areas of the culture, the unique Bontown culture. And, you know, you're having more and more bed and breakfast actually popping up in the Bontown area as well. So how do we get away from what you see in the Seven Mile area where you don't really have that opportunity to embrace the Caymanian experience? Making Bontown different where you can embrace and experience that Bontown, the essence of who we are as Caymanians. Now, uh, also, th- there are two points that... Bodentown is almost the midway point between the eastern end of the island, uh, eastern and north side, and, and Georgetown. All of the tourists heading to Moritz, to the Wyndham, uh, to all of the uh, um, tourist rental areas up there, they have to cross through Bodentown. Bodentown. I don't think that we've taken uh, advantage, advantage of that strategic uh, uh, position that Bodentown has there. Also, in, in you mentioning, you know, preserving that, the challenge of preserving that sleepish yeah. uh, part of Borden Town and then commercializing the rest. I think Anton Borden Drive, and we've seen now there's a, a shopping yeah. plaza there. Yeah. You can divert your businesses and your traffic there, and you can still have the seaside, yeah. that, that sleepy, sleeper side yeah. to it, and still retain that as well. So I think the balance can be created there. And this is, to me, where those um, advisory district councils will have a say in terms of, or, or should have a say, and must have a say in terms of the composition, the makeup. Uh, of their district and how things will operate uh, operate there, what they want to attract and what they don't want to attract. And they ought to submit some type of prioritization of what they want to achieve. I mean, the previous caller spoke of what they want to do in the first 100 days. I am hoping that within those, the first 100 days, that they actually sit down and make a plan about their vision of Bordentown. You know, how do we see Bordentown evolving? Uh, because as you rightly say, we've managed to preserve that balance between commercialization on the one hand and that sleepy type of nature of the Caymanian embrace, I call it Caymanian embracing um, cultural uh, community. We, we've, we have that. But there's also that commercial spirit, that entrepreneurial spirit. Right up there by Chester, as you were mm-hmm. start that whole area, look at what they've managed to do. Chester has a nice area where he invites people to build certain things. I know he used to have guys from the prison build um, like garbage um, pans. Well, not pans. They used to build them from wood. But they were very, very colorful. So they had, they, they managed to combine, um, you know, restaurants and stuff like that, but also with the commercialization as well. Folks, I want to remind you that you're listening to For the Record. I'm your host, Dorit Connor. Ms. Teresa Pitcairn with, is with me. We're going to the news now. When we return, we're going to talk about the advisory district councils as well. Please stay tuned for the record. We'll be back immediately after the news. Good morning. Welcome back to For the Record. In the studio with me this morning, Ms. Teresa uh, Pitkern. We're going straight to the phone lines. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, Mr. O.C. Good morning, ma'am. Good morning to Ms. Teresa. Good morning, Ms. Georgette. And for the listening public, I think most people recognize my voice. <laughs> it's, this is Georgette Ebank. And you know they all came my way. Always want to know not just how the person you're speaking to, but I trust that both um, Mr. Risa, your family, everybody's well, and Mr. O.C., your, your family, they're all well, too. And to yours. And to yours, ma'am, thanks. Very, um, I'm, I'm, I'm not long winded, I try not to be. Um, Mr. Risa, your 
Uncle Royal. And if if the police, the the men and even the women in the force now would model themselves after him, it would do well. I always enjoyed do, during the years I was at the post office out in town, and I would sometimes have to go out for something and meet him on the sidewalk. That beautiful smile, and he always had something pleasant to see. I knew your mother too, um, Theresa Sweetheart, and I have been praying for all the members of the new government, and I will continue to pray for them, that they will not just rely on their own wisdom and knowledge, but remember that the great God is in heaven, and he will give them wisdom and knowledge to govern our country, our three islands, in the right way. So may God bless them all, as I said, and I will continue to pray for all of them. And thank you, Mr. Oti, for giving me this chance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. George. Yet, uh, Mr. Risa, yeah. any comments? Yeah, thanks. Thanks very much for those um, for those kind words. Uh, I think it's in our DNA in in many in many respects. Um, uh, Mr. George just gave me a moment for pause. Actually, my uncle and my mother in particular, and as I speak of both of them, rest their their souls. Uh, the term that comes to mind is straight up and down. Um, that's how we were raised. I mean, they were forthright. They were, um, their view was that, you know, you had a duty and a responsibility to be honest with people and, uh, don't play games. And that's just who they were. That's how we were raised. And I often hear people saying that straight talk brings no falling out, but that's one of the biggest, uh, untruths that I've come to, uh, discover, when you speak the truth and, and you know if you have a sort of a a moral ecology that uh allows you to always be in a place where you are speaking truth and your truth and standing your and holding your ground you 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 quickly make enemies people will tell you that you think you know it all people will tell you that um who she thinks she is who he thinks she is and you know they will really that that part of who we were where we had that where we really lived by a code and we spoke the truth no matter what that is uh that is kind of no longer part of our um moral ecology here in Cayman and it's a it's a sort of a sadness in fact this morning I had occasion to write to one of our MLAs speaking about exactly this and uh that particular MLA was saying that you know there is no honor now among our politicians and um, I was inviting that particular MLA to try and recapture what we used to have that kind of made us special. That Because that was a part of the Caymanian charm. You know, people would say that we're conservative. People would say that, you know, we're, um, that we're always very pleasant uh, and respectful to other people and their views. That embracing spirit that brought us the kind of success that today we enjoy... We have somehow managed to, it's, 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 it's been eroded consistently. And perhaps it could start with our leaders now taking a different approach towards leadership. Uh, leadership with a certain um, reverence and respect for the truth. Reverent and respect for the people that they serve. Um, and I'm, I'm not going to be on the pulpit this morning to talk a, a little bit about that. But we have lost that thing that really really gave us that special edge where people wanted to know us because they thought that we were special mm -hmm. okay thank you very much for that mr Risa. uh before we go on to the uh, advisory district councils one of our listeners on friday uh sent an email and i didn't see it or at the time or may not have received it before we went off air even though uh it shows that uh it was sent at 
905, um, but I kept checking my emails uh, during the course of the show, and I didn't, um, I didn't see it. Uh, the listener says, hi, uh, Mr. Connor, uh, top of the uh, morning to you and guests. I'm just wondering about the direction of the conversation this morning. Aren't some of the behind door details being given with names being called a betrayal of privacy? Will this contribute to greater suspicion and discord at a time when the country is trying to heal and come together? Just just asking. Um, and this uh, listener has always given uh, some very insightful uh, comments and uh, has always spoken their o opinion and, and certainly appreciate. Uh, now, my response was uh, that we did consider the privacy issue, but we also thought, and, and uh, before I say that, it was in relation to the conversation that we were having with Ms. Uh, Emily, Mr. Arden McLean, in relation to the negotiations that took place, and he wanted to ensure that the public got his side of the story in terms, because he felt that he was being vilified and was being blamed for the independents not being able to form uh, the government. So I said that the privacy issue was considered, but we also thought that there was, that it was in the public interest to know why they were held in suspense over the weekend and the number of deliberate leaks that were filtered through social uh, media. And I also said I also believe that the names of those persons that were called are all public figures in some respect. But that public interest, it is important for the public to know mm -hmm. what was going on. They were yeah. being held in abeyance at that point in time, in yeah. suspense, not knowing you know how the what government was going to be in place uh hearing you know various stories and we expressed also our cons concerns about the fact of there being no certainty yeah. um you know what that did for investors either local or um or internationally um you know as well but the listener and the writer has ha has a point um, I, I i have to concur with you though see because um when uh, Emily McLean was speaking, he could have named other names, and yes. I thought that he was pretty respectful mm -hmm. of um, those others that were uh, involved, and he chose not to as a as a courtesy. And yet, the ones that he did name were all public figures who were involved. So I'm not sure how that uh, speaks to us or the radio show not being or being irreverent mm -hmm. with um, not sharing that information. Okay, let's talk about advisory district councils. So there was a bill that was presented to the legislature in 2010. But before we go to that bill, the constitutional negotiations, and as a result of those negotiations in 2008, 2009, may have even been 2007 Seven. to a certain extent, uh, we look at section 119 of the constitution and it addresses the issue of uh, advisory district councils there is no um, accident that it falls all the way down in section 119 of our constitution there were negotiations on various subjects uh, uh, during um, th at the time uh, we know that the honorable W. McKeever Bush has always favored uh, a bicameral legislature. He feels that a Senate would certainly serve our purpose here because there are so many people who would like to contribute in some way to the governance of the country, but at the same time are not prepared to run for a public office. Yeah. And the creation of a Senate, which would be an appointed um, body, would assist in being able to attract those persons who don't want to run for elected office to make their contribution. Of course, that would require major constitutional change, change mm -hmm. as well as uh, you know a ma major um, what it uh, does, education yeah. for, for you know for our public um, as as well. I 
I actually agree with him on mm-hmm. this bit. What it does, it provides some transparency as well because what what you tend to find is that there are quite a few people that get involved and engaged in the backdoor politics. And if you were to create such a body and a body that has the kind of respectability that and the credibility that one would want, mm-hmm. it actually exposes them to the public so that we know who uh, makes these des- decisions and the basis on which the decisions are made. Yes. Because right now there's a lot of speculation about people behind the scenes, money passing hands and that sort of thing. And it takes away from the respectability and office that one would want to have with respect to our politics. Creating something like that would bring us more, uh, in my mind, uh, bring us to a different level of sophistication as well so that you know we could see that we're evolving and we're actually cognizant of the um, responsibilities that we have. The concern that I have, uh, you know, Section 19 deals with uh, the councils, as you rightly say. 119. Yeah, Yeah. but it also talks about an area of democracy as well. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one would want to, if we could pin the whole idea of the Senate's the Senate in this area as well, you know, we'll, you know, modern uh, make the revisions that we need, and um, you know, try to make it as democratic as possible. In fact, one of the concerns that I had as I listened to you speak during the um, during the break is whether or not we are going to appoint the district council, whether or not it's going to be a government appointment, or whether or not it'll be a, an appointment from the people, because. You, you could be tempted to get into that nasty area of politics where we choose people wearing this color or that mm-hmm, color mm-hmm. as opposed to representing everyone. Although I would caution that and say the one man, one vote, making the communities a lot smaller may take away from that kind of selfish approach where you lean towards a particular color as opposed to actually doing what is in the best interest of the entire area that you represent. Okay. And uh, w- what I also want to add was uh, the fact that the inclusion of uh, Section 119 in, the, in, in our Constitution was almost a compromise. It was a last minute. And if you listen to the audio on the, uh, 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 on the constitutional discussions, and we have it all uh, live, um, it was a last minute decision. Hence, why you didn't see a whole lot in section 119 but it makes provisions for us to um to make a law that would govern the uh, advisory district uh, council it was a compromise it was something that the uh then leader of the opposition uh, honorable w mckeever bush pushed for and he got it now his administration was the administration then that was handed the responsibility because the government was elected. This was one of those situations where you found we had a referendum and we had an election at the same time. Okay. The government that pushed the referendum on the Constitution, which carried, mm-hmm. yep. lost the majority yeah. in, in, ele- the in, 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 in the Legislative Assembly. Yeah. So the public, the voting public, favored a Constitution that was basically crafted by the progressives at that time, but s- still voted the progressives out of office in terms of mm-hmm. the majority in our legislative assembly. So Mr. Bush's government then had the responsibility of uh, uh, making, uh, creating this law, uh, which was done. And then we saw uh, where the second reading, I think of it took place sometime in 2011, and it was eventually passed in 2011. We also see in some of the co- um, the uh, news releases that in 2015, I believe it was, uh, Mr. November. Ezard Miller mm-hmm. um, requested amendments to the um, Advisory District Council's uh, law and uh, the Premier, Honorable Alden McLaughlin, said that it was basically too close to the election yeah. and but it would be addressed after yeah. now which brings me to to the point that I want to get to which is that we heard on so many mm. political platforms during the campaign that the district councils would be made effective that they would be put in place 
and I'm wondering now how many of those successful candidates actually have read the, the, the law, are familiar with it, have taken it up in their hands since the elections. That, that is the one point. The other point, Mr. Risa, is we're not certain when the legislature will meet again mm. uh, after um, the meeting on the, 20, uh, on the 31st of uh, May. We're not sure. But there's a lot that the new members as well as the old members you know, have to do. And maybe this is a good opportunity to them, for them not only to be uh, f- familiarized with on, on parliamentary procedures, but also to familiarize themselves with some of these laws, and especially this particular one yeah. that they talk so much about. And, um, and a law and a body that we feel is going to be extremely, extremely effective. You mentioned single-member constituencies, and I believe that we're going to see the effective effectiveness of these advisory district councils in the single-member constituency setting that we have in place now, as opposed to when we just had the um, six electoral um, districts, right? And you would have had one advisory district council for the whole of Georgetown. Yeah. yeah. I, I to be I'm 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 hoping to see a lot more bipartisanism in this particular um, government. I am hoping that we will see folks going across the aisle, inviting persons to get engaged and involved with moving us forward. I also hope that we're going to make take a, a, a really close look at our constitution OC Mm -hmm. and Mm -hmm. make certain progressive changes that we can all live with I mean you you know and and don't just choose people based on the fact that you like them choose people who are knowledgeable about this stuff and who care about the community Mm -hmm. and who who are willing to embrace other ideas you know who are not stuck in a rut that's the kind of progression and progressive behavior and responsible behavior that I'm hoping to see with everyone in the house and I'm actually now going to hold Tara I'm going to hold Barbara and Julie and I'm calling them deliberately by names that I not out of disrespect for the office that they hold but because these are women that I know and I would like to see them take a more substantive position in the house you used to have Julie there by herself. She's no longer there by, uh, by herself. Mm-hmm. Then it was her and Tara. And one could understand the relationship because Julie was speaker and chairs. Tara, right, and mm-hmm. Tara was, uh, and, you know, obviously Julie had to be impartial as well with her responsibility. Now we have three women who are all MLAs. Two, I believe, are may well hold cabinet positions. I would like to see something different in how our legislators behave and I'd like to see a cultural transformation within the house because there's been too much toxic relationships in the house which in my mind prevents us from getting the job of the people done so I would like to see some changes I would personally like to see some changes so I'm going to start you know spreading this particular sankey within our community and inviting our members to start to hold some of our women um, in a different capacity and invite, giving them the support that they need to make decisions, leadership decisions within the House. Okay, Ms. Susan, do, uh, do we want to take a break now uh, as well, folks? I want to remind you that you're listening to For the Record. I'm your host, Dart Connor. My guest with me this morning, Ms. Theresa Pitcairn. We're going to be discussing specifically the Advisory District Council's law after we take this commercial break. Good morning. Welcome back to For the Record. I'm your host, Dorit Connor, in the studio with me this morning, uh, Ms. Teresa Pitcairn. I, I did mention uh, the fact that in uh, 2015, actually it was in November of 2015, that um, the um, Mr. Ezard Miller uh, brought um, a motion to the Legislative Assembly uh, to uh, amend 
their advisory district council's uh, law. And um, the premier at the uh, Ald uh, Alden McLaughlin at the time said um, that uh, the amendments to the district council's law are not amongst the progressives led government's priorities at this time, especially as Cayman moves to implement the one person or one man, one vote and single member constituency system for 20, the 2017 general election. Uh, so he made that uh, declaration on, on the motion brought. He said also that uh, while he recognized the importance of district councils and their functions at this time, the government does not have the time to revise the provisions of the district council's law. He said resources are currently focused on one person, one, one man, one vote, and single member constituencies. We are grappling with that now and are getting the necessary resources in place in time. So we now have single member constituency is one person, one vote. So this is now the opportunity to get on with this. And I would say that during the interim period between the Legislative Assembly meeting and while they're getting themselves familiar with parliamentary procedures or whatever, maybe some new MLAs going off to some other jurisdiction, uh, usually the uh, mother of all parliaments to view what's going on there. They should take it upon, upon themselves now to really, really start to familiarize themselves with the advisory district council's law. Now, Ms. Teresa, I'm going to ask you, do we have any callers, Ms. Susan? One, one caller. We're going to take the caller. When we come back, uh, we may go to a commercial break before that. But after that, Ms. Um, Teresa, I want you to um, lay out the memos of objects and reasons of the advisory district council um, law when we come back the bill that was presented because there were no amendments to that bill so that bill actually became law let's go to the phone lines caller good morning welcome to for the record good morning oc morning sir how are you and i'm fine uh, sir and good morning mr Teresa. morning I'm turn my radio down thank you said that the, the premier said he don't have the time to put in place the advisory district council that was in 2015. That was in uh, uh, in um, November of 2015 when uh, the motion, private members' motion, was brought by Mr. Ezard Miller. Well, I can hope that he changed his mind from that day, sir, because if I have to write the FCO myself, asking them to do uh, 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 to intervene into implementing that law for the Caymanian people, I will have to do that. Because this is ridiculous. It is, it is uh, part of our Constitution. Mm -hmm. They signed off on the Constitution to put that in law. And now this is the third administration that we've gone by. And I hope that... It is, it is in law, you know, um, uh, caller. It is in law. What Mr. Miller was seeking were amendments to it. And we're going to talk about, you know, some of the shortcomings that we believe are in this, uh, in the... Uh, current law that we have. So it is in law. It is in effect. Uh, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, that's what I'm exactly saying here. Okay. So see, if it is in law, why, don't, why isn't it implemented and let the people go along with it? I'm going to I'm gonna uh, stay ahead of the one in Georgetown. I can mm -hmm. tell the, the, the country that. And I'm calling all Georgetowners that want to have the opportunity to participate in the making or the, the running of this country. And that is the only way we can how in, in the input is by this council. Okay, call it, call it, do, question for you. Do you believe that uh, those, the membership of the advisory district council should be chosen by the premier, the leader of the opposition, or the elected member for that constituency? Or do you believe that the people themselves, the constituencies, should, ha should have a say, therefore, that they should be membership should be through an election process held in the constituency again we are living in a democracy country okay true mm -hmm. democracy has to go through the people not a dicta not dictated by the leader of the party or the government or whatever mm -hmm. i don't mm -hmm. believe in that mm -hmm. that's one reason why i did not 
agree with the, the party system uh -huh. because I've seen so many indications where that the leader tends to act like di a dictator. Yeah, and because that's that's one of the changes that would have to be made in, in, yes, in the, in, will, in the I law. Yes, I would agree with that. It has to be amended, and I hope Mr. Miller brings it forward and get it all amended quick because we need this. If I got to ask for an executive order from the FCO to put it in place, that's what we will do. They cannot, we cannot go on any longer not being able to participate in the, in the development of this country mm -hmm. and sit back sucking our thumbs okay. and getting on the, on the social media. That's not doing us any good, people. We need to get off our butts and come down to the town hall and let's form this council. Okay. And I would rather to see the people put those in place or even by a referendum. Let's use the referendum. We have the law. The referendum is, is, is a law now in our constitution. Let's use it and apply and, and form these, these councils. Okay. Thank you, Othi. I know Thank you're you. on a break. Now Thank you very much, Caller. Thank you very much. We have, we're going to try to accommodate one more caller before we go to the break. So this caller is going to probably have to make it a little bit short. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Yeah, good morning, um, Othi. Good morning, morning Mr. Teresa. Hi, morning. Um, I am hearing that um, our our ministers are going to have less, uh, like Tara, like Tara, she would have less uh, responsibility, which would be very good. Now I'm wondering if uh, the ministers, since it's one man, one vote, the are person. they going to still have? just one or two offices in the districts or it's going to be um, different offices, different places, depends on where you had to vote and who's responsible for that area. Okay, My, that, take, my take on that caller is that uh, because we have 19 single member constituencies now, each member will have the opportunity to have office in that constituency. Oh, good. Then, the uh, next thing I would like to see, I know you told, said that time, I have to make it quick. I would like for them to start with labor. Labor and immigration. I would like to see Caymanians back to work. I'm tired of seeing pictures in the papers of people from overseas being partners and joining this and joining the next thing. I'm tired of it. We're sick of it. We're really sick of it. Um, another thing, I think Ezard had the only district council in, in, in this whole island, and that was run very well. He had it for for four years. He had it actually. He started it in 2009, yeah. uh, you know, as well. Yes, Th yes, in yes, yes. Thanks. Thanks for listening to me, and you both have a very good day. Thank, Thank you very too. much, Carla. Thank you, you very much for that. Um, we got about two minutes to go to our, uh, to our break. Just want to give a little investment tip to any, uh, to anyone who's involved in commercial enterprise and stuff like this. I suggested this to one of my friends. Since it is expected that the um, each member of a legislative assembly will have an office in his constituency. If you live in a constituency and there's really no place for an office so far, no office, because we don't necessarily have, you know, business areas in, in some of the constituencies, do we, uh, Ms. Teresa? If you want to have a good investment, build a little shopping plaza or a little office space and you rent it out to your <laughs> rent it out to your um to, to, to your the member who represent your constituency. If there's not one in place there, have a little foresight, look around, see where an office can be located and uh you know put the proposal forward. Uh, just my uh, thought. <laughs> I'm 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 gonna be devil's advocate and and, and disagree because uh can we afford it? I mean, Cayman is so small. We have to. 90, no, you can't 19, put a price on democracy. Uh, no, 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 no. <laughs> there is democracy and there is practical economic reality. Uh -huh. You know, so I, I, I guess I, I, I would try to find a way where we, we can work together uh, and not create 19 different 
uh, you know, Offices. homes where we go and <laughs> yeah. yeah, no. Be, can we afford well, it? And is it practical? Yeah, yes. yeah. I mean, that it's not my call, obviously. But uh-huh. I mean, if that's the road, if that's the road that um, the government is going to go, you know, it is what it is. I just think that that money would be better spent on education, for yeah, example. Yeah, yeah. But, and and yeah. Th- there's one thing, uh, and we have to make a distinction between the two things, right? Number one is the, dis- the office for the representative, and the, the, the other part would be the district advisory district councils. Now, they could meet in a common area that didn't ne- don't necessarily have to meet in their constituency, you know, as far as the meeting is concerned. But there, there has to be, I don't believe that I would want to go outside of my constituency to meet with my representative. See, my that's how spoiled people are. <laughs> Folks, let's take a commercial. <laughs> Break. Yeah. When we return, we will All continue right. the conversation. Thank you. Good morning. Welcome back to For the Record in the studio with me this morning, uh, Ms. Uh, Theresa Pitcairn. Uh, I believe we have one caller. Uh, what we will do, Ms. Susan, we will take this we will take this call because we're going to go to another uh, to break uh, for headline news. And uh, after headline news, then we can have Ms. Theresa uh, get into the uh, memorandum of objects and reasons of the Advisory District Council uh, Bill and Law of 2010. Carla, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning. Morning, good morning. sir. How are you? My good, two good friends. This is Ivan. Good <laughs> morning, Mr. Ivan. I just tuned in here and I heard him talking about something about the offices for. MLAs and district council. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, my good friend Teresa. <laughs> as far as I know, we've been each MLA that's nineteen. Mm-hmm. Two thousand five hundred, and I heard it going up to three thousand dollars a month for their office now. Mm-hmm. So if that is correct, I don't see why the district council could share in that same thing. So it's not gonna cost no more for each member to have one in their little thing there. If that is what I'm saying is correct, you could check it out. It was 2500 and they put it up to 3000 I can tell you when it started, when Mickey would pull away from Tom, we were doing a little town hall one day, and he said he wasn't sitting in no, in, in no town hall with Tom no more. So he bought a motion, and that's how it started. At that time, only Frank McField was a full-time MLA, he had his office, so he paid for himself. So that's my take on that, but you all could check it out, and you'll have a hell of a good day. Thank you. Thank Jason. you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Ivan, uh, you know, for, for that. Uh, we're going to start, Ms. Theresa. We still have some time with the Advisory District Council's bill. Let's, let's look at the uh, uh, objects and reasons. Right. So, the what I wanted to touch on was the reason why mm-hmm. we have it, and I'm going to speak to the functions that they're supposed to have. So, in Clause 5 of the bill at the time, it says that the role that's going to be played by the council is as follows. They are to advise on policies and develop programs intended for the more effective discharge of the members' duties in relation to the district after consultation with such persons or organizations or both as the council considers appropriate. To advise the member on policies and programs intended for the more effective discharge of the members' responsibilities and to establish, maintain, and operate information systems and facilities, and to encourage and support the exchange of information of all kinds in respect of policies and programs proposed by the member. So it's essentially designed to be inclusive, Mm -hmm. to find out what is going on on the ground, and with the hope that what the members uh, uh, discover after consultation with the council, they will find their way into policies that best represent the interest of the particular community. So that's the intention, or at least that's the idea that drives this particular bill. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Right. The other part, of course, is um, the con- how these uh, councils are supposed to be structured. Yeah. 
Yes, yeah, so you'll have the tenor you'll have the tenor of the council and they have to ensure that um, there's no conflict of interest. Uh, they'll have council meetings. They're supposed to have in, uh, provide informations, information to the members and they're supposed to develop some form of regulation that's going to um, be responsible for the council, how it operates. I mean, uh, I suspect much like directors in a board of directors, mm-hmm. you have your own, um, they will define how they're going to operate. That is that is also a concern because you want something that is uniform. You don't want people in West Bay having their own thing and then people in Borden Town doing their own thing. There must be some form of uniformity so that the way they operate and function is universal right across the island and the way in which they disseminate the information from the council to the members, that must also be uniform. And then you see a sort of progression of how policies are made in the best interest of the particular community. What might be relevant for East End may not be relevant for Borden Town. Mm-hmm. What might be relevant for certain areas of Borden Town may not be relevant for certain areas of Georgetown, like South Sound or Georgetown Central. So there must be some type of platform which makes it um, universal in terms of how decisions are being made. And there must be some kind of good faith Mm -hmm. in the Mm -hmm. way in which they behave. And contractual arrangements between the government and the particular members, it has to be formalized. It can't be just something that, um, um, that you do at a whim. It must be structured and it must be able to maintain public scrutiny. If there are questions that people have to ask through FOI, we must have some Mm -hmm. avenue to have that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So it must be done properly in my mind. Okay, folks, uh, we're going to continue to discuss the advisory district councils, their formation, their roles and, and functions when we return from headline news, which will take place right now. Please stay tuned. Good morning and welcome back to For the Record in the studio with me this morning, Ms. Theresa Pitcairn. We're discussing the uh, Advisory District Council's Law of 2010. Uh, Ms. Theresa, if we could look at the section that deals with the selection of membership to the Advisory District Council. Right, so two things. They, and, I, and I think this should be, we should make this clear to the community as well, because the, the duties that the council have and the powers they have are actually conferred by law mm-hmm. and regs, right? Right. And then you have the council and they shall consist of persons that are going to be appointed by governor in cabinet. And that's what we talked about, whether or not you're going to have it through a process of elections, elections. or mm-hmm. whether you're going to have it through a, pro- a process of appointment. So you'll have a chairman, a vice chairman, a secretary, a treasurer, and not exceeding six other members, at least two of whom shall be subject to subjection two, recommended by the leader of the opposition. And this is what you were talking about, section 68 in the constitution. Mm -hmm. So Mm -hmm. in making the appointments, the governor in cabinet shall be cognizant of the recommendations made to him or her from within the electoral districts. Now that's really important. You may have someone that's living in Bordentown or say Bordentown East, and that person may have a different view about what is needed in Bordentown East. And whether or not that person was formed part of the election process for the particular minister or MLA, whether or not that particular individual should be on the on the on the council even if that person doesn't have the skill set mm-hmm. that, that that the particular council needs so we need you and I were talking during the break is it important for us to choose among ourselves who we want to represent us on the council is it a council that's going to have a plethora of people with different skill sets? Some people may have um, banking, uh, may have a banking background. Some person may have a community, may be involved in the community, but may not have, for example, a profession, but is still somebody who we need on the council because that voice is important. Or is it simply going to be 
a mixture of people based on professionalism, based on what this particular bill speaks to, which it says the electoral district may advise in relation to finance, tourism, development, mm -hmm. immigration, district administration, works, gender affairs, employment, community, health, housing, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. This speaks to some form of professionalism, but should we simply have a committee or a council comprised of persons who are professionals or really people who represent the best interest of the district? Well, if we look at, if we look at uh, some of the functions of the council, also it says there, to advise on policies, and this is uh, gener in, in a general sense, to advise right. on policies and develop programs intended for the more effective discharge of the members' duties in relation to the district, yeah. right? After consultation with such persons or organizations or both as the council considers appropriate to advise the member on policies and programs intended for the more effective discharge of the minister's responsibilities and also to establish, maintain, and operate information systems and facilities and to encourage and support the exchange of information of all kinds in respect of policies and programs proposed right. by the member. And these are all intended for the consumption of the constituents of that constituency. Um, I don't know. I, I, I think if you want it to be a democratic body, mm -hmm. it should be one that is um, elected in my mind. Yes. Yeah. yes. So that, you know, we, we get rid of the politics Partisan, yeah, get, yeah, yeah. and bring about a, a bipartisan relationship um, of people who just simply live in the community and who care about the community. So for me, get rid of the politics and then have a proper election. So the law would actually have to change to reflect that as well. And then you talk about setting out the kinds of regulations that you want that's going to actually regulate this body and they must be compliant. If the funding is going to come from government, which I think it will, they will have certain responsibilities, certain contractual responsibilities and certain responsibilities as government employees or is it going to be structured in a way where you give them the kind of independence to do what they need to do? All of these things we have to figure out and see how that's going to work. Now, th there is also a section, and I'm trying to find it in, 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 the, um, in our Constitution, and uh, without the ability at this point in time to, to point out the particular section, there are provisions in our Constitution uh, that if a particular district is not represented, does not have a member in cabinet, and we have 19 single member constituencies now, or single member electoral districts, we call uh, they're actually the official name, the legal name, single member electoral constituencies. So obviously there will be some uh, districts that have no representation yep. in cabinet. Yep. The member who is not, does not have a representation in cabinet is allowed to appear in cabinet, and I think it's uh, make provisions for on a quarterly basis. I will try to find this particular yeah, section. In it, yeah. have you have you found it? No, ma'am. It's it's not coming up for okay. some reason. I'll yeah. I'll, I'll, yeah. I'll find it. But the the point is that for them to make representations in terms of the concerns in the district, uh, what, what the needs of the district and stuff. So this is where the advisory district councils will tie in with the advice that they will then give to their elected member who in turn then goes to cabinet to present his issues in relation to his district to cabinet because there is no representation on cabinet, which goes back to highlight uh, Ms. Twyla's first call this morning in talking about uh, 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 John Seymour being in cabinet and her feeling and her optimism that Bodentown will see more and will get more as a result of that. So there are provisions now in there so that when you don't have a John Seymour in cabinet that you can make representation. So a Chris Saunders 
would be able to make representations um, and Alva Suku would be able to make representations uh, to, to cabinet. The, the concern, obviously, is that um, we've had examples of how that operates before, or has operated historically. We've had both Mr. McLean and Mr. Miller mm-hmm, mm-hmm. not being members of cabinet mm-hmm. and who have actually, although Mr. Miller's uh, organic council is not one that is um, based on the statute, it's it it operates as though it it is a council based on what the statute contemplates they meet they rep, they make certain representation to mr miller mr miller takes these concerns to the to the house mm-hmm. to the la but there is no guarantee that those concerns that are raised take and you know you know whether or not the cabinet takes responsibility and address those concerns so it speaks to the idea of making this more formal, making it um, in compliance with the law. Maybe if it is now compliant with the law and, you know, the statute actually requires a certain behavior, maybe they will take what is said by the particular MLA seriously because you will now have, you know, you will now have people on the ground saying, well, you know, we asked our representative to do this our representative actually brought it to council mm-hmm, to the mm-hmm. cabinet but still nothing is being done so the hope then is that if this is a this is now this now becomes a living and breathing document that the behavior of those in leadership in cabinet will also will, will also change exactly yeah, yeah. and it'll be, uh, come under scrutiny Shooting, because yeah. the, f- the finger can be then pointed back to them in terms of why uh, certain things were not done or were not put in, into effect. And we're actually paying people. I mean, the council members will be paid. So yes. you're not re- you can't have them being paid and, and then, you know, yeah. Ignoring their advice. It's, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Let's go to the phone lines. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Hello, good morning. Good, good morning. morning. Good morning. Good morning to you all. Just a quick question. Um, one of the ob- observers, elect- electoral observer from Commonwealth uh, Parliament, was saying that he was he planning to make a recommendation for prospective candidate that running for politics should be should have qualification. And the next thing he was saying that the smaller district, like of less than a thousand, maybe those districts could combine as one. I just want to know what your what your view on on, on those two points. Well, again, thank you, caller. Yeah, thanks very much. I get, my view, I think, probably differs from from most folks in that. To be honest, I don't think we need to, nineteen people to represent us. <laughs> you know, that's a personal view. Mm-hmm. I think that um, we can create a system where we get where we don't need nineteen people to represent six to thousand people, and we can and that we can actually do it. So that's a personal view. Uh, where one man, one vote comes into this. Um, you know, that's another issue. Uh, I am not necessarily um, someone that supports the one man, one view, the way it is currently structured in our constitution. But again, that's a personal view. I, you know, I'm not necessarily going to share my views on that. But like I said, I was raised thinking that you cut your cloth according to what you can afford. And um, if we get if we get people that are capable and competent in leadership, um, I don't think you need 19 people to do it for six for 60,000 people. And like I said, that's a personal view. Okay. And the other part of the uh, the, the observation by the uh, caller was, uh, you, you recall, I, I, I missed the second. Uh, About what the um, observers were saying. Um, in relation to, to having uh, members with uh, a certain... Ability. Uh, I'm, I'm well, ability. you know, politics is not like. Um, I mean, if I want, if I am being interviewed in a law firm, um, I have to be a lawyer. Politics is not quite that way. Politics is based more on the way in which people communicate and behave with others. So it's not necessarily a personality contest, but it's more a relationship based on um, good faith, um, how you get along with people, how you communicate, and that's a different type of skill. Uh, so, you know, in a small community like ours as well, you have to consider how our community is configured and people elect who they want to elect. That's a view. Okay. 
Uh, we have one caller. We're going to ask that caller to hold on. We're going to go to a break. As soon as we return from that break, we will take that caller. Please stay tuned for the record. We'll be back shortly. Good morning. Welcome back to For the Record. One caller online. We're going straight to the phone line. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Good morning, OC. Uh, good morning, morning, sir. How are you? I know Miss Teresa is here, but I don't yeah. know how morning. she will. Uh, no, uh, earlier we said um, that uh, he was unable to be with us this morning. He has an early court court appointment. Oh, okay, okay. Well, good morning. Um, yeah, I think Teresa's right that the... We, well, I think what I'm thinking about, you talk with a number of people that represent us and the different number of districts. I mean, it's kind of ridiculous that we got like a little over 1,000 people in one in a district and we need, you know, that many people running for office. What I've always said was that Cayman is small enough that we could have an island-wide election, then I can vote for people from East End or from North Side or from Georgetown or from any place that I think would represent me better than anybody in my district. I could cast a vote for that person. And I think that would be the logical thing to do because Cayman is really, we've got 50-something thousand people and, and it's, I think it's ridiculous that we have to have all of these people in, in office. I don't know what's going on, but that's just my opinion. So I'll leave that for you guys to make comments on. But uh, I think that would be a good idea, what Teresa said. Thank you very much, Carla. Yeah. I said this, uh, my, my voice, this, this view was shared in the highest of halls, but um, it, had no, it had no currency, this particular view. So I don't necessarily like sharing it publicly, but um, I, I still don't see any reason why we can't run our community efficiently with less people running the country. Like I said, that's a personal view. But uh, it has no currency. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is where where I would tend to differ. Uh, I, yeah. I I say, uh, you know, more is better in this case, especially when you have the single member constituencies. And if we talk about all politics being local, then you can't get it any more local than having advisory district councils having. Uh, your constituencies, small communities represented. We have seen, we have seen in situations when we had the six electoral districts that there were certain things that were not done in districts or in communities because they looked at the district, uh, you know, as a whole. So when you wanted streets paved or whatever, you have to wait until it's done in the district. I think that we're going to see much more community involvement. We're going to see that there are constituencies, for instance, where you have one part of the constituency where you have very affluent people living, and then you have another part of that constituency where not so affluent people living. Those people in the affluent area are going to be concerned about keep retaining, keeping their area the way it is. What better way to do that than to work with those persons in the less affluent areas to try to raise the standards in their area so at the end of the day, then you have both sides with a vested interest in ensuring that their community uh, remains productive, remains free of crime, free of break-ins and everything else. Because if the persons from one area of that community are moving over to the other area and cre um, committing burglaries and stuff like that, then it is in my interest, as if I'm in a more affluent area, to ensure that the standards of living are brought up in the other area so that people don't have to resort to break-ins and things like that. I think you're going to see much more working uh, together if these advisory district councils are, the composition of them are in such a way that you have a broad reflection of the diversity of the uh, constituency. I don't maybe, know if that made sense, Mr. Yeah, Risa. Yeah. I'm just saying, maybe I'm not, my, my views are a little jaundiced. <laughs> I don't think that you need councils to actually do stuff like that. But then again, uh, maybe because of the way I was raised in Bordentown, uh -huh, you uh -huh. know, 
everybody took care of everybody. Uh, we, you know, we didn't recognize people who are wealthier than us. We just knew that maybe you could go to Miss Christine to get some some ice water. Maybe we could go down by Miss Patsy or Miss Marge, Miss Marge, and they would give us a sandwich. We weren't made to feel as though we were different, mm-hmm. and maybe that's how it was some forty years ago. I just don't think that you have to structure things as they are in order to be effective. But, And I think it's a waste of money, personally. I, I think there, there, there are other ways in which we can have a more efficient way of doing things if we pay attention and if we do what we're paid to do. Uh, so that's, that's my view, OC. Okay. Uh, we have one caller. Let's go to the phone lines. Caller, good morning. Welcome to For the Record. Yeah, good morning. How are you guys doing? Morning. Fine, how are you? I'm pretty good. I just share my opinion with you. I think um, we have encountered what they call plutocracy. And the more people that are elected, the more confusion is there. And the real agenda, whatever it might be at the time, will get passed because there's so many people making noises that you won't see the real agenda until it's already passed. And usually that agenda is get the people to pay for everything and leave them with the debt. I'll leave you there, though. You see, I, I have to agree to, <laughs> to some degree with the, the, the gentleman that just called in. Mm-hmm. It's all about accountability. You know, if, you, if you're employed to do a job, you're supposed to do the job well. You know, and we as a community don't hold, you know, our elected leaders accountable. Cayman is not that big for us to to recognize what's wrong. If I drive through Borden Town, for example, I will recognize that if you're speeding and you're um, it's in a in a zone where you have the, the roads are narrow and on the left hand side you have some vacationers uh, facilities and so on, and you know that that's one area of securing our tourism. If trucks are speeding and going through there, uh, you know regularly. We as people who live in that community is going to recognize that we don't need a politician to come and tell us that, you know, speeding is wrong and, you know, somebody should pick up the phone and let people know that this is the behavior. And the politicians who actually live there must see it and want to do something about it. So, one, paying attention because that's what you're paid to do. Being accountable, you know, maybe what we need to have is some job description for the politicians and maybe we hold them accountable to see whether or not they're um, in compliance with the job description. Maybe we should also ensure that they spend their money the way they spend it at home, i.e. spend it responsibly. You know, you don't go and make decisions about the public's purse that is impractical and has a huge has a huge negative uh, ramification for people that live here. But it's up to us, the voters, to actually, uh, the voters and the employers, to ensure that the politicians fly right and we hold them accountable. But again, that's a personal view. Okay, I, I finally, finally found it, Ms. Teresa. Okay. Section, let's look at um, section 47 of the Constitution. And the, tit- uh, it's the, the, the title there is Attendance of Persons at Meetings. On page 29. <laughs> I, as you getting it, I'm getting it. And if we look at section yep. 47, subsection Three, I would like you to read that okay. for us. Where, we found it at the same time. <laughs> Where an electoral district is not represented in the cabinet, the member or members of the legislative assembly representing that district shall be entitled to attend a meeting convened by the cabinet once every three months for the purpose of making representations with respect to matters affecting their district, making budgetary representations when the annual plan and estimates are being developed. What it doesn't say is that cabinet has a responsibility to ensure that when these representations are being made, they pay attention to it and they act on it. And I remember making that comment. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And we, we wouldn't be able to bolster that position uh, by having it in the law. Of course, the law won't trump the Constitution, but if it were but we, in the but law... But we can, yes, yeah. Yes. I mean, the fact that it's absent from the Constitution doesn't mean that we can't include it in the legislation that actually regulates the council. Yeah. So, so again, and, and this is my argument, if we were to ask 
how many members of our legislative assembly in the past have, number one, made representations to cabinet based on section 47, subsection three, and two, how many of them have gotten results as a result of their representations. I know for a fact that um, uh, Mr. McLean and Mr. Miller have made representations in the past to, um, to, to cabinet. Um, they also felt, because it says uh, every three months, and that was some, uh, a provision that was not always mm -hmm. adhered yeah. to, and they felt that it is their constitutional right, right to appear in cabinet every yeah. three months. Of course, they weren't necessarily supported in, 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 in that thought process, but I think they're absolutely correct that every three months there is an obligation. And again, this is where that feedback from the advisory district councils to your representative representative and you don't you won't have four or five of them to go to for one of them to pass the buck and say oh i thought this other person was going to represent you you have four in this case you have one that must go to cabinet and represent you rather than four or five or three of them passing the buck and no one going there at all yeah. i am still sold on advisory district councils, I am sold on single member uh, constituencies, <laughs> and I believe that it is the best thing next to the late Norberg Thompson sliced bread. My view is looking at her behavior at the facts. I know Mr. Miller has done it. I know Mr. Arnett. In fact, they do it more than on a quarterly basis. I know that for a fact because I know what... Uh, you know, I know the sort of things that certainly Mr. McLean has brought to the house. Mm -hmm. So the fact is, we have a situation where this has been done in any event. And it's sometimes all for naught. So there must be a change in behavior because no matter how much law we have, the Constitution is the height of our legislation. And folks have not <laughs> respected that. I mean, this is one of the reasons why, for example, the Advisor Council is not a living vehicle for us today. Okay. So we need people who will pay attention and do the job, get past the personalities. That's what I'm hoping to see. Not, not Our laws aren't enforced, for one thing, but we need to get past the personality politics, OC. Okay, um, we have two, two questions. I'm going to give you the second question first. Uh, that'll give you a time to look it up in, in, in the bill, uh, which is, um, will meetings be open to the public? That is meetings of the advisory district council. And the other question was, will the, um, will the districts have their own budgets? And the answer to that one is uh, districts will not have their uh, own uh, budget. But, but budgets. based on what I've heard in the conversation when they were um, campaigning, that's what they were saying, that, they that they're going to yeah, they're gonna give them their own, own budgets. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And the first question? Uh, the first uh, one was, uh, will meetings be open to the public? Uh, do, uh, if we look at the Advisory District Council's bill, uh, see what it says I in relation it to its public. meetings. I think it did yeah. I, I, I think it did. Let me just find it again. Yeah. I don't know. This is in and out. In the meantime, we, we'll just let our uh, listening audience know that we won't be taking any more calls this morning because we will soon be um, going off air. I saw this. Okay. I believe there, there, there are times when it will be open to the public, and there are times when the uh, committee, uh, the council will, will, will um, consult with their member of the legislative assembly, and that may not necessarily be, be in public. If my it depends on how it's structured, you know, OC. Yeah, uh -huh. If, for example, it's done by way of elections, and you choose persons from within your community to represent you, it may be the case that once you choose those persons, they will have meetings like a sort of an executive committee and they will stay in touch with the community, but also stay in touch with the MLA, the, the politician, whether it's in council, whether that person is in cabinet or sitting in the back bench. That executive that is appointed by those persons that are in attendance at whatever meeting that they have that's going to be the key that that group of people who are being paid by the government because it says that under section six that the funds available for the purpose of enabling the councils to perform their functions shall consist of such sums as may provided 
may be provided and so on. Can the council may receive donations or they may re- raise money through community mm-hmm, activities mm-hmm, and so mm-hmm, on. Mm-hmm. But I know during the campaign process, I heard folks saying that, you know, they are going to be properly funded and you won't have to go holding your hand out to get donations and so on. Okay. So that's one. But it depends on how democratic it's going to be. So you might have a group of people representing the community. They elect the bodies that they want to represent them on the council. And it is that elected body that has the conversation with the um, MLAs and then with the community. If it's chosen by cabinet, it may have a completely different flavor. Yes. You know, and that, you know, you know, may not quite get to develop the kind of democracy that we wanted to have. Okay. And just uh, before our uh, wrap up very quickly, just to point out also that the, uh, section six, subsection uh, two says, councils shall have no power to charge to the general revenue of the islands any of their expenditures. They can't t- charge it. So that funding have, would have to come, come about they, 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 So that's the law is going to have to be changed mm-hmm, to mm-hmm. revise how this is going to happen. People are not going to go out there, um, OC, and do this for free, mm-hmm. you know, and it's it, it will be a lot of work. If, for example, you're dry, trying to devise policies, mm-hmm. the person that you elect to the executive committee will need to have the skill set to draft these things and actually submit it to the government mm-hmm, or mm-hmm, the, the, mm-hmm. the relevant MLA. Mm-hmm. So those things, which is why I said, you're going to have to have proper contractual relationships. You're going to have to have proper regulations. And this must be universal, okay. not just with one community. Any quick uh, closing comments from you, Mr. Risa? No, no, just thanks. I, I was very, I was heartened by one of the questions that was raised at the very beginning, which invited me to consider the role that my uncle, the late Royal Anderson, and my mom, the late Valerie Anderson, played in our community with respect to law and order. They had a certain... Um, cultural ecology is what I tend to say that invited us to be honest with each other and not just honest with each other on a community basis but honest with our leadership with the view that our leadership respect our views because we are their employers okay folks I want to thank you for allowing Radio Cayman and by extension for the record into your homes, into your vehicles as you traverse the busy roads of the Cayman Islands into your places of work, whether it be an office cubicle or if you're working in the outdoors. I also want to thank Miss uh, Theresa Pitkern for being with us this morning, uh, rendering her sage you know, advice and comments and observations as well. I also want to remind you that we are brothers and our sisters keepers. There is always someone out there who's less fortunate than we are, and I ask you to extend a helping hand to them. If you can't do that, then I suggest you donate to a worthy charity because we always want to consider those who need, not necessarily those who want. I say to you, have a great day. Continue to support your radio station, Radio Cayman. Join Sterling Dwayne Banks at 12 noon for a talk today. Have a wonderful, beautiful, and safe day. And as usual, we ask the good Lord to bless these three wonderful, beautiful Cayman Islands.